Hello and welcome to our uh, Warm Up to Fire webinar. Uh, my name is Ildro and I am the uh, Senior Director of Global Life Sciences Solution for I4I and I will be your host today. Our presenter is uh, Jacqueline Brunner and she is our uh, Senior Director for uh, Encoding Technology. Today, Jacqueline will demystify FIRE with a comprehensive overview. FIRE is a powerful standard for exchanging healthcare data electronically. Our presentation will take you through the uh, fundamentals, the uh, customization possibilities, global harmonization, and modernization potential of FIRE. Uh, but just before that, we're going to, to address some uh, regular housekeeping. Uh, please have your microphones muted to reduce uh, any audio interference or, uh, or echo. If you use a phone to listen to the presentation, uh, please make sure your computer audio volume is off or actually very low. Um, questions are welcomed. Uh, please type your question in the chat panel and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, to open the chat panel, uh, first click chat at the bottom right of your screen. Next, uh, click direct at the top of your screen and then select the i for i host from the dropdown. Uh, please note that this presentation is being, is being recorded. Uh, all audio and video captured during the body of this presentation will be included in the recording. And at uh, that point, I'm going to uh, hand things over to, over to Jacqueline. Thank you, Jill, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us today. I'm going to assume that everyone here is fairly new to FHIR, so I'm going to start with the basics first. Um, then I'm going to talk about FHIR and EPIs, the benefits of having EPIs in the FHIR format, and finally, what it takes to build FHIR files, what the stakeholders need to do, and what we've done to date. And I just want to mention that some of you may have seen the FHIR presentation that we gave to the SPL process team uh, in September. So please excuse us if the first part sounds a little familiar. There will be some new information coming for sure, though. As I mentioned, we are going to start with the basics of FHIR. What is FHIRE? Well, FHIRE stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And I know it sounds like a new buzzword, but in actuality, FHIRE has been in development since 2012. It was developed by HL7, the same organization that brought us SPL, um, which has been the standard that's been required in the U.S. for a while now and is now in use in Canada as well. But while the SPL standard is focused mainly on drug labels and establishments, um, FHIR is a standard for exchanging healthcare information electronically between different systems. FHIR files can be in two file formats. They can be in XML, like SPL currently is, or they can be in the JSON format. Uh, we're not going to get into any detail about that today, though. The F and H in FHIR, which stand for Fast um, and Healthcare, are pretty self-explanatory. The I is for interoperability, which is a key feature of FHIR. And uh, this, it's the, this interoperability that opens the door to tons of different use cases. The most obvious use of FHIR is to link the vast array of different electronic health record systems. Um, imagine that um, medical documents such as test results clinic letters and imaging scans could be shared between the different systems that hold them. And imagine that healthcare providers could easily exchange information with health plan providers. And imagine further that uh, clinical and healthcare data could be shared for research purposes. All this coordination for data exchange would be a huge step forward in improving patient care at all levels. And a lot of us, of course, have smartphones and health technology wearables that are able to track health data, such as heart rate, activity level, calories, respiratory rate, and sleep over time. But currently, this data is only available to the person using the app. By using FHIR, this information could be integrated or used to supplement a patient's electronic health record. And that would give a healthcare provider a lot, a bigger um, uh, view of the patient's health. And clinical support systems, they are, of course, incredibly useful tools, but when the information that clinician um, using the uh, system receives doesn't factor into the context, it means that they need to wade through a lot of non-relevant information. 
with Viar, the information presented can be targeted to the patient's circumstances, such as age, gender, um, other medical conditions, etc. And that would mean that all the information that's presented to the user um, is relevant. The FHIR data model can be used to describe almost anything related to health data. For example, medication and dispensing and, and administration, immunizations, hospital visits, diagnostics, laboratory tests, family history, and lots more. There's over 157 categories of FHIR data, actually, and each of these are represented by resources. Remember that the R in FHIR stands for resource. Each resource contains data elements that are specific to its purpose, and resources can link to other resources. So, for example, the resource that describes the administration of a medication only contains information such as the specific date and time the administration took place, who or what performed the administration, the route the medication was administered through, um, the dose that it was administered, etc. This information doesn't do a lot on its own, but the medication administration resource links to a lot of other resources, such as the resource that details the person or device that did the administration, the medication request, and of course, the medication itself. And in turn, each of these linked resources have their own set of specific data, and they can link further to other related resources. You can think of these resources as building blocks. One block on its own isn't a lot of use, but when you get a set of blocks, you can really start to build something. In this case, the entire picture of the administration of the medication. And of course, before you can administer a a medical um, a medication, you need to have the drug product, and this is where electronic drug product labels fit in. So I think we can all agree that having product information in electronic format improves access and generally benefits everyone. But while EPI has been used by some jurisdictions for quite a while, there's others that are just starting to get on board. There are EPIs currently in use or being developed all around the world. Um, you're all familiar with SPL in the United States, of course, and in Canada, Health Canada has been and transitioning to using the SPL schema for product monographs. Um, and they're calling the files XNLPMs. Japan's Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency replaced paper labeling with a custom XML format. And in the EU, the, um, the EMA has a pilot in progress, and the news that's hot off the presses is that they have just published their first two EPIs as part of this pilot. Many other jurisdictions, such as Jordan, Brazil, and Malaysia, are also adopting EPI. So you can see that EPI definitely has traction, um, but there is some disparity in the formats that are being used. And the goal with FHIR is to develop a common global standard for, for the EPI. And to that end, on August the 2nd, a FHIR implementation guide API was published. Probably the easiest thing to do is to relate a FHIR API to an SPL, which is, again, we're all familiar with, I think. And we can think of a drug product label SPL as being made up of three parts. We've got the narrative text, which is the sections, the paragraphs, the lists, the tables. Uh, we've got the medicinal product data, which is the dosage form, strength, route of administration, ingredients, and packaging. And we have the organization data, the labeler and establishment names, addresses, unique identifiers, and the contact information. This concept flows into FHIR EPI documents as well, but in the case of FHIR, medicinal product data is extrapolated into eight smaller, more discrete resources. Each of the eight FHIR resources used for SPL holds a smaller, more precise set of metadata values, and I'm going to give you a very high look at these. A full EPI would, would, uh, would have what's called the composition resource as the first one. And the composition resource is analogous to the SPL content. And kind of like SPL, the content is attached to images, 
the organization and the medicinal product definition. The images are called binaries in FHIR, and just like with SPL files, the images are held separately from the contents. In the case of FHIR, they're, act, they're actually held um, in resources as binary data rather than actual JPEG files. The organization resources like the labeler and manufacturer section in SPL. And the medicinal product definition holds the high level product information the brand name, generic name, dosage form, product code, and the route of administration. Each medicinal product can contain one or more administrable products. An administrable product describes the route of administration and characteristics of the product when it comes to final dosage form. That's after any mixing or transformations have been done to it. So this information isn't currently something that's included in the coding of SPL files, um, but this resource isn't required in FHIR APIs. Each administrable product has one or more manufactured items. This is the product in the dosage form that's found in its primary package. The manufacture item resources contain the product characteristic metadata. And the resources for each ingredient in the product and each package product definition linked to their uh, respective manufactured item resources. Each ingredient resource describes an ingredient as it is in the product, so it includes the ingredient role, strength, and basis of strength. The ingredient resource is linked to their related substance, manufactured item, and manufacturing organization. The substance resource is the substance as it is separate from the product, and it links to the organization involved in its manufacture. And the package product definition resources hold all of the packaging details and link to the medicinal product that they're contained within, as well as to the manufacturing organization. And if we were creating a European EPI for an SMPC, we'd also include the clinical use definition. So these documents can have IDNP metadata related to indications, contraindications, interactions, warnings, and undesirable effects and all the details about each one. SPLs don't have this metadata currently, so they don't use this resource. Anyway, once you have a complete set of resources that represent your EPI, you package them in what's called a bundle. And eventually, you'll package a set of bundles into a list, which is a set of all of the versions of a bundle or EPI. So here's an example of a fire resource. All resources have an identifier that's unique to them within the document that they represent. They also have a section for metadata about the overall resource, such as the version number and the date and time it was last updated. And there's a section that holds the human readable summary of the resource content. And finally, the meat of the resource, um, the metadata about what the resource is about. And in this case, I have an example of an ingredient. So you can see that the meat of this ingredient resource holds the ingredient strength and the basis of strength, and also holds some links to the resources that are related to it. In this case, the medicinal product definition, which holds the detailed product information, and also the substance, which holds um, information such as the ingredient name and code. So keep in mind that each individual EPI fire resource can hold a lot of information and not all of it's available intrinsically from within the metadata or even the content of, a, of an SPL. So I just mentioned that the substance resource could hold the ingredient name and code, but it could also hold the substance's molecular weight, the chemical structure, the quality standard, form, even the substance's source material origin. And the substance resource could further link to resources that delve into great detail about its polymer, nucleic acid, or protein properties. This information isn't required, but the fact that it can be included uh, demonstrates how much detail can be captured by time. So getting back to the real world now, you're probably wondering how fire resources and bundles can be used in relation to EPIs. So I'm gonna go over a few of the benefits. A major fire EPI benefit is that product labels can be tailored to the individual, making it simpler to read and to understand. Um, as you know, I'm sure, drug product labels can be extremely long, uh, which can make it easy, easy for consumers to miss key information. 
In fact, there's been studies done that show that the average number of adverse event warnings per drug label is almost 70. And these studies show that long, complex lists of potential reactions uh, can result in information overload. If there's too many vague or hard to interpret adverse drug event warnings, uh, prescribers um, tend to either ignore them or just don't prescribe certain drugs. So using FHIR, the information presented in an EPI can be tailored to patients based on their circumstances, so that only relevant information will be presented. And in fact, information that they should pay particular attention to could be highlighted. So for example, a male patient with a latex allergy definitely needs to be made aware of any information related to this, but probably doesn't need to see any pregnancy um, information. And when prescribing to an older female patient, the prescriber doesn't need the pediatric sections, uh, but does need the geriatric sections. Another fire EPI benefit is global harmonization. Having a common structure for electronic product labels using fire supports interoperability on an international scale. So imagine having a patient who travels from the U.S. to Sweden. This patient needs to get medication that's comparable to one that they use at home. So these medications are obviously going to have commonality between them. The active ingredient, the strength, the dosage form, and the indications. If both the U.S. and Swedish PIs are in the FHIR format, this common information could be used by a healthcare provider to easily identify an equivalent. And to take this even further, if one country thinks they're going to have a shortage of a drug, the health authority could find equivalent products from other jurisdictions to potentially import. The last benefit I'm going to mention is technology related. Using FHIR for EPIs means we're using a newer, more modern exchange standard. SPL is based on HL7's version 3 standard from uh, 2005, so it's almost 20 years old now. And while SPL's been great, um, it is limited in scope to mainly the data represent representation of drug product, establishment, brands, and label or code information. The focus of SPL was communication within systems in a healthcare establishment. HL7 FHIR is a more modern exchange standard that will allow for communication between different healthcare systems. It's based on a widely used exchange standard. It's modular and is forward and backward compatible. And while SPL is just the data representation, FHIR includes a communication mechanism in the API side of the exchange on top of the data in content. So this will allow um, IT solutions to be developed faster and easier. So we've talked about the theoretical aspects of FHIR, the what and the why, but the piece that we've uh, saved for the end is the one you're probably most interested in, and that's the how. How do we get FHIR to be implemented or ignited? First off, the support and backing of health authorities on a global scale was needed. In order for FHIR to truly live up to its mandate, it must be the format and use at all the major health authorities. And it looks like that's got the support of FEMA in Europe, Health Canada, the US FDA, and a lot of other jurisdictions as well. So each health authority will also need to create their own set of business rules, validation, and viewers or style sheets for displaying the files. They'll also need their own um, internal validation systems and have to educate and train their resources and stakeholders. The FDA, in fact, is already at work. Um, a draft implementation guide is in progress, and they're experimenting with different approaches to transitioning SPL submissions into FHIR. One of the reasons the FDA is um, very interested in this is the 21st Century Cures Act, which specifies that there must be a standardized API access to patient and population data, and this points directly to FHIR. But having health authorities ramped up is only part of the puzzle. They still need software vendors, such as I4I, to be able to understand and support fire EPIs. To that end, there are fighter meetings, connectathons, and working groups, and specifically a working group for fire EPI, which we're lucky enough to be involved with at their weekly meetings. At these working group meetings, we look at the technical aspects of fire. And the group is working on the second iteration of the FHIR EPI implementation guide. At I4I, we do come from a global labeling perspective, 
So we're able to leverage our deep knowledge of SPL, XMLPM, the EU QRDs, uh, templates, etc., to give feedback on what's needed to completely support these and other types of package inserts and the business rules associated each, with each one um, in FIRE API. One thing that the FIRE working groups want to be able to do is to complete back and forth within a FIRE file, something that can't be done with the, the SPL standard. This would mean that comments and track changes would be exchanged with the regulator, the FDA, Health Canada, EMA, etc., in the same way they currently are, using a Word document. So now you've probably managed two files um, currently, one in Word and one in XML. With FIRE, you'd only need to manage one because you'll always be working in the FIRE file. In fact, a contribution I4I made is about how comments and track changes should be handled within the FIRE API framework. And our ideas are being considered for the next version of the implementation guide. Working groups and meetings are one thing, but we've also started working on supporting FIRE in our applications. We have an A4L prototype that includes a publish from our US templates to SPL and FIRE. Um, from our Canadian templates to XMLPM and FIRE, as well as from our European templates to FIRE. And in all cases, the FIRE output is in both the XML and the JSON formats. And although there isn't an official style sheet to view the FIRE files created by A4L, there are a couple of developer viewers that show the FIRE resources and how they're linked. So this view is taken from the bundle visualizer. It's an open source tool from ClinFire for displaying FIRE files in an interactive network graph. And it shows off the way the different resources are linked to each other in this sort of web-like manner. So you can see how the ingredient resource links to its related substance and the substance links to its API manufacturer. And the product, um, which is labeled here as the medicinal product manufactured, has the re resources for the ingredients that are manufactured for it linked to it. And it links to the organization that manufactures it as well as to the labor organization. And there's another visualizer from N program that shows the FIRE API in a different view, one that's slightly more linear and shows the nesting of resources. So it's a little bit more in line with what you might be used to um, seeing with the FDA style sheet. So in this visualizer, you can clearly see the uh, product information with a uh, link to the label organization. The package information shows um, any nested packaging as well. The manufacturer item information, which contains the manufacturer organization. The ingredients, which further contain the related substance. And the authorization information. So now, although this visualizer displays the resources as nested, they are still, in fact, separate with links to each other. But this just demonstrates how varied um, the views of FIRE files can be. And I also want you to note that the FIRE files used for both of these visualizers were produced in A4L. We've literally been playing with FIRE. And now I'm sorry, I have another bad pun for you. Thank you for letting us help you get warmed up to FIRE. We hope this has been an informative session, and we look forward to keeping you up to date on FIRE as it evolves. Uh, we're now ready to move on to the uh, Q&A portion of our session. So if you haven't sent already your, in your questions, please feel free to do uh, to do so now using the uh, WebEx Q&A panel. Uh, also, if you're watching the recording of this presentation and you want to send us a question, please contact our I4I support team at support at i4i.com. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending and for the, uh, the um, couple of great questions we had. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you.